Thank you very much. It is a very great honor to be here to give this lecture, and thank you all uh, for coming. So I would like to break my lecture into two parts. The first part will be an introduction to the basic ideas understanding um, concerning the understanding of cancer at a molecular level, and it will be uh, an introductory material to introduce people to the ideas. And the second part is uh, going to present uh, some very, very advanced uh, or recent research. It's difficult to know, uh, from, for me to know, what is the level of comprehension of what I'm going to say among the people. It would be very unfortunate if I spoke for 45 minutes and uh, basically spoke to myself and maybe to a few people in the audience. So I would like to start by saying, how many people in this room have a training in chemistry? Okay, how many people in this room have a training in chemistry but don't want to admit it? <laughs> there, there, are, there are a few. How many people in this room have a training in biology? Oh, good. I mean, that's uh, most of the room. How many people in this room have a training in physics but no training in biology? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can see me personally after the lecture, uh, or you may, uh, uh, you, you can leave also, okay? <laughs> now, you know, I, I would have been happy if there had been more of you to change the style of the lecture, but uh, there it is. So I, I think we have a lot of biologists, and so maybe some of the introduction that I've prepared will be not necessary, but it's always good to start with a common ground. And um, what I want to talk to you today is about our understanding of oncogenes, which is another thing. Uh, you know, people may be shy uh, to stand up and speak, but is there somebody who is not shy who can define what is meant by an oncogene? So is there somebody in the, in the room who is willing to stand up and define what is oncogene? Yes, please. You can shout to me and I'll repeat what you say. Yeah. Basically, genes responsible for cancers. Absolutely correct. Uh, why are they responsible for cancers? Since you asked the, answered the first question so fast, uh, I think we should ask you a second question. Why, why, what, what, is, what does that mean, responsible for cancers? Genes basically responsible for uh, protein synthesis. So uh, indirectly, uh, through proteins, they, uh, they, uh, they cause cancer. Yeah. That's, I think, that's good. Now that brings up the risk that the first 15, 20 minutes of my talk is uh, known to everybody. So let me repeat what he said. Oncogenes are genes that cause cancer, and they cause cancer by making proteins that interfere with some things in the cell to cause cancer. So is this, is this do I need to discuss this further? Do people feel I need to explain it further? No. Not needed. Yes. Okay, for the physicists, we will explain it further. <laughs> so let's uh, begin. Uh, so oncogenes are uh, genetic elements in the body that cause cancer. Peyton Rouse, and he gives his name to a virus, a retrovirus called the Rouse sarcoma virus. So you may not have heard of the Rouse sarcoma virus, but it's actually in its architecture and how it works, it's very similar to the HIV virus, which is also a retrovirus. It operates under very similar principles, but it's a different virus. So can we have the slides on the slide uh, on the stage off? Is it possible? Yeah. But some of my slides will be difficult to see. Um, but leave the slides in the audience off on so I can see whether anybody's falling asleep. <laughs> so, so only the, the, OK. Great, thank you. So here's a, a picture of Peyton Rouse, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 1966. Now I, wanna, I want you to look at some numbers on this slide. 
He discovered in 1911 uh, this thing that I want to tell you about. And he won the Nobel Prize in 1966, which is 55 years later. In 1911, Peyton Rouse was 32, 31 or 32, which means that when he won the Nobel Prize, he was 86. And there are two lessons to be learned from this. One is that in science, like in many other areas of human activity, if you come up with an idea that is completely new and completely ancient, so if you can just live long enough, you will be recognized. <laughs> now, what um, uh, uh, Peyton Raz did was to do an extremely simple experiment, which uh, I need to reopen. Uh, it got closed. So I just want to show you Peyton Rouse's experiment because it is actually very simple. It's one of the cases where something, somebody does something very, very simple and you learn something that changes the future of medicine. So Peyton Rouse uh, noticed that some of the chickens in the market where he went or that would be brought to him had uh, tumors that we call sarcomas. Whoops, went too fast while I was talking. So this is a... a a tumor called a sarcoma. It's a tumor of connective tissue. And um, Peyton Rouse noticed that some of these chickens would have these tumors, which we now call uh, the, the, the sarcoma tumor, and that he could do an experiment where he cut out this tumor and he ground it up. So that's what this little movie is showing. He's crushing up the tumor and grinding it up. And then he takes uh, whatever this crushed up material and he filters it through a very fine filter, which is so fine uh, that bacteria cannot go through it. And then he injects it into a healthy animal and they get tumors. That at that time, there was no electron microscope at that time, that was the operational definition of a virus. So what this proved is that the sarcoma uh, is caused by a virus. And now using an electron microscope, we can actually see the structure of the virus. Like I said, it's, uh, it's like HIV in its general concept. So I should stress that most cancers are in fact not caused by viruses. And most cancers are not infectious. But it turns out that when you discover something in a virus, you can learn a lot because the genetic structure of viruses is very simple. And that's shown over here for the Ras sarcoma virus. And I don't want to uh, take the time to go into the virology or the study of the viruses uh, that are the retroviruses, but instead I just want to tell you that we now know that there is a single gene, a piece of DNA, in the Ras sarcoma virus, which is called SRC or SARC or for short for sarcoma. It is that single gene that is responsible for causing the cancer which the chickens had. Now, much later, Michael Bishop and Har Harold Varmus made the stunning discovery that this gene called SARC is not some strange gene found only in the virus. It is actually very, very closely related to human genes. All of us have nine SARC genes in our body. Whether we like it or not, they're there. It turns out that this SARC gene in the retrovirus is very, very closely related, almost identical, in fact, to the SARC genes in our body. Except that the SARC genes in our body produce proteins that work properly. The machinery is working properly. What the virus, in a very nasty way, has done, has broken the regulation of the SARC protein so that it doesn't work properly. Unfortunately, we get accidental mutations in our SARC proteins. For example, in certain colon cancers, the same kind of mutations that have happened in the SARC virus happen in our human body, and then you get a colon cancer. So, as I said, the Ras sarcoma virus has um, accident, not in, in evolution, it, it broke the regulation of the SARC protein. And Oncogenes are the pieces of DNA that code for proteins that will cause cancer, as we were told by the gentleman in the second row. And I don't need to repeat it except for the gentleman in the fourth row, but genes are pieces of DNA 
and they have a genetic sequence, which are the four nucleotide bases. And we know now that the uh, triple, triples of these nucleotide bases encode one or more, uh, specifically one or the other of the 20 amino acids. So that the gene sequence leads to the sequence of a protein. And that is the translation of the genetic code. The remarkable thing about proteins that some of you may know, but not all of you may appreciate, is that they have this property that I consider magical, which is that they are a heterogeneous linear polymer. That is, this is the sequence. It's one sequence from the start to the beginning of a particular protein. And they will, this, this sequence of a protein translated from the gene will spontaneously adopt a specific three-dimensional structure. This is one of the pieces of hemoglobin, the protein that makes our blood red. So this is the sequence of the hemoglobin subunit, and this is the structure of hemoglobin, as Max Peretz first discovered. So we now know that proteins have this ability, based on their sequence, to fold up into a three-dimensional structure that's specific. And I, I consider this magical because no human engineer at present can design a heterogeneous polymer, heterogeneous meaning every piece, every bead in the polymer is different in 20 different ways. None of us can design a heterogeneous polymer or even a homogeneous polymer that when just let free in solution will fold up into a specific three-dimensional structure. In fact, the only ones that we can design are copied in one way or the other from nature. So this is a remarkable property of natural proteins that they fold up to have a specific three-dimensional structure. So the SARC gene in the Ras sarcoma virus codes for a protein. That protein is called the SARC protein, and it folds up into a specific three-dimensional structure. This is the key part of the protein, shown in three dimensions, with the surface of the protein colored yellow. And uh, what this protein does is bind ATP. Uh, let me show that again. This here is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the molecule that is the energy currency of the cell that you may be, at least if you're a biochemist or chemist, you'll be familiar with. And what this protein does is catalyze the transfer of a phosphate group onto another protein. So it's called a kinase, an enzyme that will chemically mark another protein by adding a phosphate group on it. And so the SARC gene codes for a kinase that marks other proteins. Now, what is the normal SARC protein? We have nine different variants of the SARC protein in our genomes, and what are they doing normally if we haven't encountered a Ras sarcoma virus? They belong to a family of proteins. We all have hundreds of these that are called signaling proteins. Any animal or plant, any multicellular animal, including us, relies on each cell in our body communicating with all the other cells. Cancer is, in a way, nothing but a breakdown of that communication. So here is a normal cell with the nucleus and the cell wall, the cell membrane. And this cell in our body, if it's a proper cell and not a cancer cell, will be listening all the time to signals that other cells are sending out. And we're familiar with these signals. Insulin is one such signal that is sent from one part of the body, goes to cells in another part of the body. And Normally, the cells must be responsive to external signals. So if the external signal says, be quiet, they will be quiet. If the external signal actually says, die, they will die in order to preserve the organism that is us or a plant or an animal. So these signaling systems rely on cell surface proteins called receptors that are sitting in the membrane of the cell. And so here's a schematic diagram of one. And so basically what happens is that we have hormones or other proteins that are circulating, sent from one cell to communicate to this cell. Here's the cell membrane of one cell. And the hormone will bind and activate chemical reactions on the other side of the membrane that then send a signal to the nucleus instructing the cell to divide, to stop dividing, or as I said, even to die. So the essential idea is that these signaling proteins are activated by circula circulating hormones. So for example, here's a red hormone activating the red receptor. And most often what happens is the addition of phosphate 
onto the activated receptor. So that's a phosphate group here. And remember, I said that the SARC protein is a kinase. What it does is it'll bind ATP, and it'll transfer the phosphate group onto another protein. So it's a chemical marker or a chemical uh, signal that's generated by the arrival of an external signal. So the normal SARC protein is a kinase, it's shown here, and it can phosphorylate other proteins and add phosphates onto parts of the other proteins, marking them for action. And this must only happen when the signal is received by the receptor. In other words, the signal transduction system must only turn on when a signal is received. And in order to be receptive to signals, that is only work when a signal is received, each of these signaling proteins, including SARC, have mechanisms that keep them off. They're basically switches. They're not electronic switches, like in our electronic equipment. They're protein switches. And so they have an off state, where they're off, and we have determined structures of these using X-ray crystallography, and now increasingly using cryo-EM. And so here's the three-dimensional structure of the SARC protein, the normal SARC protein in the off state. And there are a number of interactions here that basically prevent it from binding ATP and transferring phosphate. And normally in our bodies, if we're healthy, the SARC protein switches on and off between two states. This is off, this is on. When it's on, it can phosphorylate other proteins. And notice that in the off state, there's an interaction here, which also includes phosphate. So this tail interacts with this SH2 domain here, off, on. And actually what's happened in the SARC virus is that the virus has taken this gene, put it into its own genome, and then deleted this tail through random mutational events. This tail is deleted. And so what happens is that the sarcoma virus version of this signaling protein cannot switch off. It's always on. This, this is deleted, and so this is always on, and it always sends a signal. So when the virus infects a cell, the cell will have activated SARC proteins, which I show with these red dots. They will interfere with the signaling. They will tell the cell to divide uncontrollably, even though there's no signal saying divide. And that's the start of the tumor. So this is an example of how an oncogene protein can go wrong. And when it goes wrong, it can cause a cancer. This is a viral protein, but as I said, we get mutations in our bodies that cause the same kind of thing to happen. And there's a disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia in which a protein very closely related to the SARC protein is disrupted in its regulation. In fact, it looks very much like the SARC protein. Its regulation is broken, so it always switches on. When you switch on, you get this leukemia, which is absolutely deadly. It will kill the patient unless, and today, you can take a drug developed by Novartis, and there are other drugs in the market. The original one was called Gleevec. And as Professor Pillay mentioned, what my lab did is we didn't develop Gleevec that was developed by Novartis, but we, through our structural mechanisms, were able to explain how Gleevec works. That's not the topic of today's lecture. But I'll show you the structure which we determined of how Gleevec binds to the kinase domain that it inhibits. And so in green here, is the chemical called Gleevec. It's very beautiful in the way it mimics partly ATP and then completely jams the machinery of the kinase, preventing it from functioning. It shuts down the malfunctioning switch, and that's the action of Gleevec. So when Gleevec was first developed, it was the first cancer drug to be developed through understanding of the genetic problem that caused the cancer. And it's remarkably effective. If you take Gleevec, the malfunctioning of this kinase is immediately corrected, stopped. Wonderful. In fact, when this was developed, we thought that a major advance had been made in the war on cancer. And it's true that it is a major advance. And people who've been taking Gleevec, particularly if their cancer is detected early, have been living for many years. But unfortunately, people soon realized that after you take Gleevec or any targeted cancer drug, that is a cancer drug that's targeted to a specific molecule that's, that's not working properly, the cell 
This is amazing to me. The cell has an ability to mutate that protein so that it no longer binds Gleevec. And this is a terrible, terrible thing. In fact, for the current generation of cancer drugs, when a patient takes a cancer drug, within weeks, a mutation will arise that will prevent the drug from working. And so here is a map of the target of Gleevec, which is a protein called ABL, Abelson leukemia virus tyrosine kinase. Uh, Gleevec, Gle uh, sorry, the, the chronic myelogenous leukemia is not caused by a virus, but viruses led to the discovery of these proteins, so they often give their names to these proteins. This is a kinase. It looks very much like the SARC kinase. All you need to see here is sites of mutations distributed throughout the protein that prevent the action of Gleevec. This is a terrible thing that's happening in the clinic all the time. And the other thing I want you to notice here is that here is where Gleevec binds. That's there. But notice that these mutations occur at many sites in the protein quite distant from the site where Gleevec binds. So it would be obvious if a mutation occurred right where Gleevec binds. You, you could make, for example, a change in the protein. So a residue that's small in the wild type or original protein becomes large, just blocks Gleevec binding. But that's not the only thing that happens. You have mutations distributed or scattered throughout the proteins. In biochemistry, we call these kinds of mutations allosteric effects. That's a technical term, allosteric, which means action at a distance. These are things that are able to have an effect on the active site or center of chemical catalysis of the protein, even though they're located very far from the protein. And understanding the origin of allosteric mutations is the current focus of my research. So that's the introduction that I said would be uh, a simple hopefully simple explanation for the background on oncogenic proteins. I now want to switch to research currently going on in the lab, which is extremely, um, uh, using tools that are extremely advanced, that is available to all of us, but developed only in the last few years. So I'm going to talk about an oncogene called RAS, R-A-S. Is there anybody here who's heard of RAS? Oh, yes, go ahead. What is RAS? Again, you can tell me and I'll tell the audience. Absolutely, it's an oncogene. Absolutely, it's an oncogene. P53 is a very important oncogene. But what, what, what does RAS do? Right, it's in solid malignant tutors. It's one of the most important oncogenes in human cancers. But does somebody know what is RAS doing? Yes, two. Yes, it is. It is a key signaling pathway. In fact, all oncogenes, almost all oncogenes, are involved in these signaling decisions. So I'd like to ask, um, what is it? What 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 is its mechanism? Like we have a cut. Yes, GTP. What it? Yes. It's a, It's using GTP. But does anybody know GTP is guanosine triadenine? Uh, sorry. Guanidine <laughs> triphosphate GTP like ATP, uh, but what what you know like in a car I can talk about the engine. In the old days we had carburetors and spark plugs. Um, we have the starter key. Uh, you know we have the brakes. We have uh, the muffler. So I want if, I want to know if somebody can just put a name onto what RAS is. It's a G protein, absolutely. Absolutely correct. In the in the activated state, it's bound to GTP. Inactive state is bound to GDP. But what I would like you to tell, if you can, is just like I can say, muffler, brake, key. What what is you know if it were part of a car, what yeah. what would it be? It binds to RAF and it further activates MAP kinase. Yeah. These are all the things that it does. Yeah. But I'm searching for, if I had to use an analogy, and if a motor car had RAS in it, what would you call it in English? That is guanine exchange factor. 
Okay, you would call it an ignition key. That's actually correct. But there's an additional aspect. So it's an ignition key. If you're turning, it'll turn on the engine. That's, hmm? What's that? No, RAS doesn't do phosphorylation. It's not a kinase. But it's, ignition key is excellent. But it's actually more important than an ignition key. There's one other aspect to it. Does anybody know? So ignition key is really good. You turn the car on. You turn it on. Engine starts. But RAS is able to do one other thing, which is accelerate. Yeah, it, it, can, it can also accelerate. <laughs> but it's got one, one thing that's really important. Yes? It can stop. That's the thing. So it's actually a timing device. And all G proteins, we heard the word G proteins, all G proteins are essentially timing devices. The cell has hundreds of G proteins, of which RAS is one. They're all timing devices. You can think of them as ignition keys, perfectly correct. But it's a very special ignition key. You turn the ignition key, and then tick, 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 tick. After some time, it shuts off the engine. This is very clever. We, don't, we could make ignition keys like that, but we don't because we'd be on the highway and suddenly the car would stop. But the reason nature builds these ignition keys is that, that stop is that they're initiating pathways that are going to cause growth, development, all kinds of things. And you don't want to have these things run away. It should come as, it should come as no surprise then that RAS is such an important oncogene found mutated in what is it, 30% of human tumors. 30% of human cancers, if you sequence them, you'll find a RAS mutation. And that's because it's this ignition key that is broken. It no longer automatically switches off. Or it switches on when you don't want it to switch on. And so it is part of these signaling pathways that I had talked about. And uh, so here is a cell surface receptor. So, so as I've shown you, kinases are operating up here. And RAS is immediately following the kinases. It's the, I, I, I had never thought of RAS as an ignition key. Who used that? Uh, who said it's an ignition key? Yeah, I'm going to use that in all my lectures from now on. <laughs> and if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you tell me your name later, after the talk, I'll even credit you for it. If you don't tell me your name, no credits. I'll use it for free. Uh, OK, well, uh, but then you know your idea will be stolen. And one of the things in science is you must protect your intellectual property. <laughs> I've never, never referred to RAS as an ignition key. But from now on, it's what it is, OK? It's a self-inactivating ignition key. And there it is. That turns the engine on, signals to the nucleus, and the whole thing starts. So RAS works in the following way. As we heard from people in the audience, it's a very, at least, uh, there are we very well-informed people in this audience. And so it binds GTP, as we heard, and it's on when it binds to GTP. It's on because it takes a shape that allows other proteins to bind to it. And sh it's shown here. And somebody had said RAF, RAF, that's what binds the other things that bind. So when GTP is bound, the ignition key is switched on, and it engages uh, the the, the gear, so to speak, of another protein that's going to signal. However, if GDP is bound, it takes on a different shape. There's a shape change. And no longer can the kinase bind to it. Now, what's beautiful about RAS, as I said, is it binds to GTP, but then it is an enzyme. And it will catalyze the hydrolysis of GTP. That is, it'll, it'll by itself cleave the terminal phosphate, switch itself off. That's the beauty of the mechanism. As soon as it binds GTP, it turns the ignition key, but then it's a timer. Tick, 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 off. That's how it works. Now, somebody else said accelerator, and that's also correct in the sense that the cell has both accelerators of the system and deaccelerators of the system. Uh, now, there's a protein called GAP for GTPase activating protein. It's a deaccelerator. What it will do is speed up the switching off. And there's a protein called a GEF, guanine nucleotide exchange factor. It is an accelerator. It'll cause every time RAS is switched off, it'll switch it back on. So now you can start to see how the cell is engineered. And all these G proteins are engineered this way. You have an ignition key. See, I'm using it. I'll continue to use it. You have an ignition key that turns the engine on. The ignition key will then be switched off automatically. But there are regulators that will control how fast 
the ignition key will be switched off and how fast it will then reset and turn on again. Gaps and gifts. Mutations in RAS now will cause cancer. So we wanted to ask the question today, uh, what are the mutations in RAS? What mutations will cause this thing to stop working properly? Obviously, mutations that just cause the protein to break down and not fold will be deleterious, then though you've just damaged the whole key. But are there mutations? What are the mutations that will interfere uh, with the functioning of RAS? And some of those mutations we already know because cancer patients have them. But are there other mutations that will interfere? That's the question we want to ask. Now, first of all, the fact that these oncogenic mutations are so common, the fact that mutations arise so quickly when you take a drug is actually surprising to me from the perspective of protein principles. And to explain that, I want to tell you the second magical property about protein folding. The first magical property I already said, the magical property is that you have a heterogeneous polymer. If you let go of this heterogeneous polymer, it will fold to a specific three-dimensional structure that works. This is, has been understood for a long time. What has also been understood for a long time and is also magical, and I use the word magical to mean a phenomenon that is true, that exists, but is difficult for us to understand this. The second phenomenon is that proteins are remarkably tolerant to mutation. That is, you can mutate a protein to an extraordinary amount, and it'll still work. Actually, that's how evolution functions. Without that property, there would be no evolution. Let me show you a simple example of this. This has been known for a long time. These are structures of the globins. So at the top are three human globin subunits. Two of them are from hemoglobin. One of them is myoglobin. So myoglobin is the protein that is in tissue that stores oxygen. It what makes tissue red, hemoglobin is what makes blood red. So these are human proteins up here. And down here is a protein from a plant. And if you can see this, I don't know if you can see it because it's down there, but if you can see this, you'll see it's the same structure. In fact, I'm an expert on protein structure, and if you just on a computer showed me a, a plant globin, and asked, is this a plant globin or a human globin? I wouldn't be able to tell you the structure without a lot of study because the structure looks the same. But the amazing thing about this, these globins that's been known for a long time is there's no sequence identity. It's down at 10%, which is essentially like random. That is, the sequence of the protein has changed in evolution such that between extreme versions of the protein, there's essentially no residue in common. There's only one that's absolutely necessary. So the sequence changes enormously, but the structure still folds and works. It binds the heme group, binds oxygen, it functions. That's a magical property. So not only can nature build self-assembling polymers, it can make polymers that are self-assembling that are resistance, resistant to mutation. Remarkable. But that goes against the idea that oncogenes uh, you know, are, are so uh, sensitive uh, to mutation. Of course, they're sensitive to mutation because they have all these complex behavior. They're not just binding uh, uh, oxygen and doing a simple thing. But we wanted to understand what is the sensitivity to mutation of a protein like RAS. That's what uh, we wanted to ask. And today, there are remarkable developments in technology that allow us to ask this question. We didn't develop those technologies. I'm not really going to talk about them today, but I'll just describe the two technological advances that made this work possible. The first is DNA synthesis. We can now chemically synthesize DNA at low cost, rapidly, so that if you wanted to make many, many, many variants of RAS, thousands of variants of RAS, you can design these variants. By variants, I mean there's human RAS, then there's mutant RAS, another mutant RAS, a third mutant RAS, and so on. You can make these mutant RAS molecules very fast. Actually, you don't make them, you just order them from a company, and in, at least uh, if you have a good ordering system very fast, the company sends you back the DNA. So the first advance is nucleotide synthesis, which lets you synthesize thousands and thousands of genes at will. And so here's, you, you can synthesize thousands of variants. So each star is a mutation. 
The second, and this is the really great advance, is something called Illumina sequencing. It's what's called next generation sequencing. That's what lets you go into a clinic and have your DNA sequenced and see if you have a mutation in any protein. This sequencing technology allows you, in the, in the, in the special study that I'm about to describe, allows you to take mutant proteins, say mutant signaling proteins, put them into a cell, so this goes into a cell, this goes into a cell, this goes into a cell, and as long as you can measure a property of the cell that you can detect and separate, you can then sequence millions of cells in an afternoon, and that allows you to figure out what works and what doesn't. This is a very simple explanation of what's going on, but, but I think I just want to give, give you the idea, DNA synthesis is now cheap, and DNA sequencing is not only cheap, it's super fast. And this, of course, is underlies clinical medicine in terms of precision medicine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about some studies in oncogenesis. So you can do experiments like this, which we call saturation mutagenesis, meaning you mutagenize every possible thing, at least at the single mutant level, and uh, you can do, uh, do this willy-nilly. So supposing you have a protein. And this is the work of Ramaranganathan, our collaborator. Supposing you have a protein like this, shown in white, and it binds to a peptide shown in yellow. You can now do experiments where you take every residue in the protein, every amino acid. I've chosen one here, glutamine 95. At position 95, there's an amino acid called glutamine. And you can, using these technologies, change glutamine to all of the 20 amino acids. And you can do that for all positions, and you can do that for combinations of positions if you have enough time and money. And so you can make what we call a library that is a, this is actually just evolution in a textbook. Evolution has been doing this for the last three or four billion years. Uh, we can just do this now uh, on a much, much, much sm smaller scale for single proteins or classes of proteins in a test tube. And then as long as you have a way to separate a cell which has a working protein from a cell that doesn't have a working protein. You can sequence the gene for this protein before and after selection, which lets you score what works. So if you do that experiment for this protein, it's called a PDZ domain, but doesn't matter. It's not RAS. If you do it for this protein, just like the hemoglobins, but now you're doing it in a test tube, you get data that look like this. And so let me just explain what this is. This is the PDZ domain. This is the sequence of the PDZ domain from left to right, the, the protein sequence. So these are the amino acids. There are 20 different ones, at, at one of the 20 different ones at each position. Very good, that's the sequence. And then in this matrix, the columns are the result of what happens if you substitute each residue by another residue. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but here's a lysine residue, K, at the last position. And then what the column is, is simply change it to alanine, change it to cysteine, change it to aspartic acid, change it to glutamate, and so on. Blue color indicates a mutation that caused the protein to not work. And the key result here is there's very little blue. This is simply the same result that nature got through billion years of hemoglobin evolution. This is now done in a test tube for this protein. The protein is able to tolerate many, many mutations and still function. This is an experimental demonstration of this magic of the protein folding code. It is very, very tolerant to mutation. But the RAS proteins are special, like other signaling proteins. You can now look at the sequences of the RAS protein. So here's a structure of the RAS protein for, across evolution, animal evolution. RAS is an animal protein. So here humans are not shown here, but here this number is the identity and sequence between RAS and whatever animal is shown here and humans. So in other words, RAS in mouse is 100% identical to human. RAS in this manta ray is 99% identical to human. This is actually an extraordinary result because what it's saying is that in animal evolution, RAS has not been able to mutate. It's under such selection pressure to not change its sequence that it doesn't mutate. 
naturally. And in fact, that's consistent with the idea that it's an important oncogene because when you do get RAS mutations at certain sites, you get cancer. And that's reflected in the natural history, natural variation of RAS. But we wanted to ask in a test tube, what is the sensitivity of this cycle, on, off, on, off, either accelerated and deaccelerated or not? And to do this, we use the technology of DNA synthesis and high-throughput DNA sequencing. And the details don't matter. We've published this in case anybody's interested. You can read about it. Basically, we took a bacterial cell. RAS is normally an animal protein. But to keep things simple, we put it into a bacterial cell. And we set up this bacterial cell so that the cell will only live if RAS is going through the cycle properly. And the way we did that is actually quite simple. We grow the bacteria in the presence of an antibiotic called chloramphenicol. So these bacteria, if, they put, if they're, you're growing them in culture and you add chloramphenicol, they'll die. But they will live if you make a protein called chloramphenicol acetyl transferase, or CAT. So if they make chloramphenicol acetyl transferase, that will destroy the antibiotic, the bacteria will live. And we made the production of chloramphenicol acetyl transferase dependent on the RAS cycle working properly. These are details which may be hard for you to take in, but the experiment conceptually is simple. You start with bacteria in which we're expressing different RAS proteins. Each RAS is mutant at a different position with a different amino acid. Then we grow them in the presence of the bacteria. Then the bacteria that live or have a functional RAS cycle. It's able to produce RAS GTP and bind to the RAF binding, RAS binding domain of RAF and trigger transcription. And then we sequence using Illumina sequencing, uh, the sequence after the selection and before the selection. And then the difference tells you what works, what doesn't work. And uh, we carried out, and I, I'm just going to end very soon here in case you're wondering how much longer this is going to go on. And we're just going to show you two experiments of many we did. In one of them, uh, we have this uh, RAS. Again, uh, you remember it's an ignition key. So RAS is in the on state, and then it'll switch itself off. And in one experiment, we put the regulators, GAP and GEF. And these are together controlling the speed of activation and inactivation uh, in, in an appropriate way. And in the other experiment, we call it the unregulated cycle. Again, the ignition key switches on, then switches off. And then it switches back on spontaneously after some time, switches off. But, but it's not regulated in any way. And then we run this experiment. We sequence all the uh, thousands of se uh, variants. And then we ask what works, what doesn't work. And I'm going to show you two data points before I end. And, and they show you how different RAS is from a simple protein like hemoglobin or the binding protein PDZ domain. So first of all, let's look at what happens. That is sensitivity to mutation when the regulators are present. So if you just consider this, what RAS is doing, it binds GTP. That's one thing it does. Second thing it does is it hydrolyzes GTP. So it's an enzyme. Third is it binds to a protein when active, which is called RAF, RAF. Fourth thing it does is it binds the GTPase, activating protein. Fifth thing it does is it binds the guanine nucleotide exchange factor. So it has to do at least five things on top of being able to fold properly and bind GTP. So under this condition, the matrix of mutational sensitivity looks like this. Now the projector, any projector, dims the diagram. I'll show you this quantitatively in a minute. But the key thing that emerges from this analysis, but because the colors are a little dimmed, it's hard to appreciate, is that essentially the matrix is completely blue. Most mutations now, when the regulators are fully present, um, are cause function, work a little worse. And you can actually see that in a quantitative diagram. On the x-axis is the effect of a mutation. So the red line means no effect compared to normal RAS. And if you're on the left of the red line, it means the mutation caused RAS to work less well. And so the majority of mutations you see are not good. And of course, in evolution, mutations that cause RAS to not work as well would be removed through natural selection. So this provides one explanation for why 
grass is so conserved. But the other experiment we did was to remove those regulators. So this is RAS just sitting quietly in a cell, if you like, without any action from the receptors. And it will by itself switch on and switch off and run. What happens? When we look at the mutational sensitivity, it's actually dramatically different. And you can see that in the histogram. So this is when the regulators are present. This is when regulators are absent. Maybe I'll just show you the color diagram because even with the dim slide, what you now see suddenly is the appearance of red. Many, many positions are red. What red means is that these are mutations that switch on RAS. The ignition key turns on. See, I used ignition key again, like four or five times already. So I think you should give me your name, and then I'll put acknowledgment somewhere. Uh, so you can see every red dot here is actually a mutation that turns the ignition key on more rapidly than normal. Now, we actually understand the molecular basis for why the ignition key turns on, to some extent anyway. But I think what I will do is I, I'll actually stop here and just acknowledge the people who did this work rather than going into more detail uh, in order for us to have some time for questions if that is permitted. Uh, so I, I won't keep talking now. I'll just end uh, and uh, acknowledge uh, 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 people who did this work. Now this slide is actually quite interesting and maybe it'll be interesting to you as well. I work in uh, California. My group is a diverse group. We have people from many, many different countries in my lab, including America. Uh, but I find it interesting that this slide only has people of Indian origin on it. Uh, when I conceived of this project to uh, study the mutational sensitivity of RAS, it was considered a crazy idea. Uh, and no sensible person would uh, take on this project. Uh, but uh, I like to think that maybe the fact that we're from a country where the sensibleness of an idea is not always the highest criteria for valuing the idea caused this slide to have Pradeep Bandaru, Neil Shah, and my collaborator Ramaranganathan uh, prominently displayed. Thank you very much. Do we have questions or we just uh, ask for questions? Yeah. Uh, Activity involves a lot of uh, GAP and Jeff. So uh, has it been uh, found out exactly what is the ratio of GAP and Jeff? Uh, OK, I'm being asked a question. Um, now, you know, when I give a lecture and I'm asked a question that I cannot answer, <laughs> um, that actually is the thing that makes me happiest, provided the question is sensible and your question is sensible. So I'll repeat your question, which is, do we know, so again, I, RAS, I, I mean, I love this. RAS is the ignition key, OK? And the gap and the gaff that you're referring to is basically the spring constant on that ignition key, like how quickly it'll come back. And what you're asking is, do we know how tight is the accelerator yeah. and, conversely, the deaccelerator? Exactly. And uh, the answer is we don't actually know that, because that's a very difficult um, experiment, uh, but we um, uh, you know, what I haven't told you, and I decided to stop talking, uh, we've been studying the mutational sensitivity of RAS mm -hmm. under no gap, no GAF, only gap, only GAF, and so on. This gives us signatures for how RAS behaves under different conditions. And that's actually allowing us in some mammalian cells to discover what must be dominant, gap or GAF. But there's a complicated yeah. question. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, it was a lovely talk. Um, I had the question on the uh, slide where you showed some mutations are beneficial. Um, are there any correlations between positions which are beneficial, uh, like distant correlations? Yes, like uh, a lot you're of asked, what are those? You're basically asking me um, uh, about something that I decided not to talk about. Uh, but. Um, <laughs> You know, since I wanted to get questions, and you asked a question, so I can just uh, talk about it. Um, what, what? But I forgot, forgotten where I put those data. Okay, you don't need to. Uh, 
let's not worry about it. Uh, let, let's not worry about finding out where I put it. But, but yes, I think the beauty of uh, what we call saturation mutagenesis or deep mutagenesis is that we know everything there is to know about single mutants. We know the structure. We're able to do both computer simulations as well as um, biochemical measurements. And so the whole purpose of doing this is to get exactly the understanding that you ask about, which I think we are getting now. Another reason to do this is that we don't at the moment have a RAS drug, but the, but the activities of organic chemists tell me that we will get a RAS drug within some time. Once we get a RAS drug, as soon as a patient takes it, within weeks, there will be mutations. And uh, so basically what we're learning is what's the spectrum of mutations and their correlations, as you asked. So that's two questions, which I think, um, you know, I could answer your question, but I think it's, it's a really deep uh, question, so thank you. Yes. Um, for HIV, uh, when the virus attacks the host cell, yes. there is a receptor, but now they have discovered there is a co-receptor, yes. CCRX5 molecule. So instead of targeting a drug to co-receptor, there are many individuals who are mutant in the yes, receptors, absolutely. and they do not bind. So it's better to target the host cell instead of targeting the virus. Yes. Is there can. such a possibility here? Well. Um, here, of course, there's no virus, so whatever you target will be the host cell. But maybe what the way to rephrase what you're saying is instead of targeting RAS, why don't we target one of the things that RAS works with? And uh, I think that's a perfectly uh, sensible idea. Nobody has succeeded in doing that yet, but I think the idea is perfectly reasonable. Hello, sir. Uh, it was a very nice lecture. I just would like to ask a very simple question as to uh, RAS uh, is uh, mutated very easily. So is there any mutant which does not mutate RAS? Is there any? It, it gets mutated very fast. Like, But is there anything which does not cause mutations? Are there cancers? Yeah. Yes. I'll With give that. you an interesting With answer that. to your question, which I don't understand. But, but I'll... No, I will just uh, rephrase my question for you. Okay, maybe I didn't understand the yeah. question. Okay. So, uh, you said uh, mutations in RAS cause cancer. What causes mutations in RAS? So, there are... Uh, is there any mutant which does not cause mutations in RAS? So this is yes, what, the is answer there is, any way RAS will not get mutated? Yes, any there time? is, and um, I, I, there is a good example for this. So it turns out there are two groups of lung cancer patients. Mm -hmm. There are the groups of lung, lung cancer patients who have smoked cigarettes, and groups of lung cancer patients who have never smoked. They're called never smokers. It's not good enough, I think, to have smoked a little bit in college and then stopped, but never smokers. And it's, it's uh, very interesting, actually, that what happens is that if you've never smoked a cigarette and you get lung cancer, most likely you have a mutant mutation in a protein that's one of the other components in the signaling pathway, such as the epidermal growth factor receptor which of course activates RAS. So you're activating the RAS pathway, but you're doing it by mutations elsewhere. Mm -hmm. If you are a smoker, then chances are you have a mutation in RAS. Now, the reason this is different, I think, I may be wrong, I'm not an expert in cancer genomics, different is that when you take chemical carcinogens, they act directly on yes. the DNA. Yes. And it's telling us that actually RAS is not so easy to mutate. That is, RAS doesn't get mutated, typically, or at least statistically, mm -hmm. simplifying, unless you do something that's carcinogenic, you know, like smoke cigarettes. It's easier to mutate the EGF receptor, easier for the cell to mutate the EGF receptor. And maybe intuitively the idea is RAS is actually a very central ignition key, as I as we heard. And it's actually harder to mutate it. And what's actually happening when you smoke cigarettes is you, you know, you're hitting the ignition key with a hammer and breaking it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
So here, actually, you've shown us something about. Well, I had a question there. Let me answer that first, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. Uh, so in the first half, uh, you stated that uh, Gleevec was the first drug which was used. To, Gleevec was the drug used. The first drug developed against a known, targeted towards a known genetic mutation. Of course, okay. there are lots of cancer drugs that are, that are more general. OK, so uh, you said it uh, resulted into the allosteric uh, effect causing mutations. Uh, so was it, uh, and you said uh, it caused mutation within a few weeks. And also, you made a statement wherein the people who consumed this drug could live long. So they could live with uh, the yes. mutation. Yes, so itself. why? Is, the, is your yeah. question why is, well, how do they live long if, if, and if they it, get yes. mutation? Yes, yeah. so the reason for that, a cancer doesn't involve only the original mutations that occur. In order for a cancer cell to become malignant, it has to have additional mutations that cause it to break out of its normal place and go. And one of the things that happens during the onset of cancer long after the original mutation, is that uh, you get the, the cell loses control. We heard P53, it loses control of uh, DNA repair pathways, it loses control of chromosome number. So cells that are in an advanced stage of cancer development have a higher rate of mutation than cells that don't. Normally, our mutation rates are very low due to DNA repair. So if you do a DNA sequencing right now, and you find a mutation in the ABLE gene, which is the oncogene in chronic myelogenous disease leukemia, long before the cancer has manifested. If you take Gleevec at that point, you may live a full life. I mean, there may be cancer specialists who know a better answer than I do. The problem is that most people, many people only get diagnosed after the cancer has progressed to a very advanced stage then you're in a stage where the cells are mutating rapidly. Then it's, you get extensions from most cancer drugs taken at that stage, extensions of life that are very depressing. You know, three months, four months, five months. Yes? Based on your data with respect to gain of function and loss of function mutants, we get to know like uh, what are like the mutations which are correlate uh, or relevant with respect to the cancer. So is it possible to predict uh, genetic predisposition or predict whether that particular person might have a mut uh, cancer in the next coming years? Um, so the answer has to do with prediction about whether cancers will develop. Um, I think that, based on genomic information, I think that's a very, very difficult. I certainly can't answer that question. And I'm not sure how reliably people can answer that anyway because of the multi-component. You know, many things have to happen. That is, you, can, you could have a mutation and live perfectly fine because additional things don't go wrong. But the way genomic information is collected is accelerating at a huge rate. So I think people will get correlations that will be helpful. Maybe we should stop at this. Yeah, thank you.